Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I'd like you, whoever the you is in your life more. I'd like you more if you were more like me. I mean, if I'm being honest, I've thought that more than once on more than one occasion. You know, we'd understand each other a lot more if you were just more like me. We'd work together better, more, if you were more like me. Um, I would love you more if you were more like me. I mean, we can begin to say this in lots of different relationships, but the truth is, that's monotonous. It's the same repetitious expression of you everywhere. Not to mention that it sounds, it starts to sound a little arrogant when I'm being honest about that for me. And so when, if we're gonna move to an adventurous place, we need to understand the unique ways that the differences we have actually bring life and bring adventure. And so this weekend I thought, man, it would be so perfect to hear from someone who not only loves the differences of each person, understands the differences, but he's also certified by Gallup in StrengthsFinder and has spent time researching and understanding the nuance of each personality profile and strength. And so I'm really excited for you to hear from one of our own. He's been on the stage before, but Eric Williams, one of our pastoral staff here is gonna help bring the message on how our differences can bring more life into our relationships and the biblical principles that actually back all of that up. And so will you please at all of our campuses, put your hands together for Eric Williams. Thank you. Well, I want to start today with a question. Do you remember the last time that you were asked to do something that only you could do? Do you remember what that thing was that after you got done doing it, sure you may have been like physically tired, but mentally and emotionally you were just pumped up. You were ready to go again. In fact, you couldn't wait to be able to do that activity over and over. Now I'll bet if you were to actually think about those moments in memory, some of the peak moments of your lives would start to come to mind because that's Really, those great memories in our lives happen when we're engaging in the areas of our strength, engaging in the areas that we've been called to do. And one moment in particular comes to mind for me. It was an entry point into discovering the dream that God had placed in my heart, and God used to kind of music to, to help me kick that off. Uh, I was a senior in high school, maybe a college freshman around that age, and I wasn't really going to church. I wasn't plugged in anywhere, but my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, Abby, she was. She was going to a small church in, uh, in Holland, Ohio, and they were getting ready to start a contemporary service with a Christian rock band, but they were looking for a drummer, and I just happened to be a drummer. So my girlfriend called me up, and I was, uh, you know, hanging out, and she called me up. She said, hey, my church, they're going to start a band, they need a drummer, would you be willing to come over? And I think they're practicing right now. And I, I mean, I was sitting down in my basement in front of my Nintendo 64 playing GoldenEye with two uh, large Marcos cheesy breads and a two liter Mountain Dew that you know, didn't gain an, an ounce of weight for me at the time. So I mean, I was living in the prime of my existence. And I said, sure, I don't have anything going on, whatever. So I went and I grabbed my cherry red drum set, threw it in my 1993 Saturn something. I don't even know if they had model numbers. It, it had a spoiler and a sunroof, so I was happy. And we drove down. I drove down to, to the church, and I got my drum set set up, and I started playing with these other musicians. And we started out playing hymns and just adding drums, like literally opening up the hymnal. Let's go to 622 and just add some drums behind it. So we were really good. And then... <laughs> And as we progressed, we started playing other contemporary Christian songs at the time. In fact, I've got a photo of our band. This is a Consuming Fire. Uh, we were listening to a lot of Third Day at the time, so uh, the photo's been doctored to protect the identities of the innocent because nobody really wants to be in a photo next to a guy that looks like a sea urchin just died on his head. I have no idea what was really going on there. All I know is I was just passionate about adding more and more squirts of that L.A. looks hair gel, just, you know making that happen. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to report my girlfriend did marry me, so that's a plus. Uh, but music was really the first step for me to discovering my purpose. And as the years went on and, you know, I got involved here at Cedar Creek, one of my first volunteer roles was in the band, in the student ministries band they had at the time, and slowly got, uh, you know, connected with other opportunities, ended up playing here on the weekends from time to time. And I don't know if you noticed this, but at all five of our campuses, we have over 120 different musicians and over 140 different production volunteers. These are people that come from all different walks of life. They have different personalities, different skill sets. And in fact, on the auditorium stage that you're in, you can see there's different instruments on stage as well. There's different pieces of production equipment that, use, that are used to make this weekend experience happen. 
So, in musical terms, we would call the putting together of different things to create something better, we'd call that harmony. And for those of you who maybe stopped, you know, getting involved in music around fourth grade or so, uh, let's just get everybody together on the definition of what harmony is. So I invited one of our musicians, Jess, to come and help us out. So please give it up for Jess. All right, so when we talk about harmony, let's start with melody. So Jess, can you play the melody to something that everybody would recognize like Amazing Grace? Yeah, most of you recognize it. You could probably complete the song. It's, it's familiar to you. Now, but on its own, the melody is a little boring. So what if we added more of those melody notes together? Now, just added the same notes, just a couple octaves separate from each other. And yeah, that gave it a little bit more life. It made it a little more interesting. But honestly, the same notes together didn't really add a lot. So what if we put unique notes, different notes, different tones, and space them together in such a way to make a better sounding song like this. You see, harmony in music is when you take different notes, different tones, and you mix them together. You properly place them together to make something better. And what it does is it helps inject the melody with emotion. So ultimately, that the story that the song is telling, you can leave that place at home, and you can travel somewhere, and you know that you've changed along the way before you come back. And with harmony, notes are never alone. They're always accompanied with others. And harmony can take on a number of different feelings and emotion, from happy and joyous, too sad and dark. But you see, when you know the strengths of each individual note and how they interact with one another, it creates a better narrative for the song that makes sense along the way. But sometimes you can hear a familiar song that seems to get lost and take an interesting turn. So you mix that in. We were going in the way that you all knew. We, we knew where we were going, and something came up along the way. We seemingly got lost. It doesn't make sense anymore. But when you know the strengths of the individual notes and the power contained within them, you can make it come together and make sense along the way. Doesn't that, like, when a, when a song comes together, you just get that feeling, that same feeling that you get when it sounds like everything is right and everything just makes sense, and you kind of have that deep exhale. <sighs> Thank you, Jess. Give Jess a hand. So this entire series, we've been talking about how to take some of our monotonous relationships and make them more adventurous. And this week, I want to talk about how God takes this idea of harmony in music and applies it to our relationships. And the way we're going to do that is by exploring a section of a letter that an early church writer named Paul wrote to the Roman church. Now, Paul wrote a lot of different letters, and usually his letters were correspondence with other churches that he had either received letters from, or he'd been there, or he met with them, and he was addressed topics of concern. Now, all indications say that Paul never, uh, actually never visited the Roman church before he wrote this letter. So he's writing this letter as kind of a general overview to Christians, and the section that we're going to cover specifically talks about how to conduct yourselves as a Christian, and specifically how to conduct yourselves in interactions with others. So you can follow along in your notes, it'll be on the screen, or pull out a Bible app if you have it with you. We're going to start in Romans 12, verse 1. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. I don't know about you, but if you spend any amount of time in church or a church environment, generally we have one particular thing we're thinking about when we hear the term worship, and, and that is what? Singing, yeah, singing, exactly. In fact, at your campus, somebody may have come on this stage and said, hey, we're going to worship together in just a second. And then what do we do? We sang three songs together, sometimes four, depending on the week. But Paul is taking a slightly different approach here to clarify that worship is actually offering ourselves to God. 
Now, you could do that in a number of different ways. You can worship through singing. You can worship through praying. You can worship through reading scripture. You can worship through giving. You can worship through serving. Heck, there's even a way to drink coffee if you do it right that's actually an act of worship because worship isn't just a transaction. Worship is relational. So God is passionate about us offering ourselves up together in relationships. As Paul goes on, he says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, as a Gallup Strengths coach, I get a chance to meet with individuals, with couples, with teams and organizations, and I help them transform the way they think about what makes them special and transform the way they think about what makes the other people around them special in order to productively apply the gifts and the talents and the strengths that they have been given. But time and time again, we come up against multiple different behaviors and customs that I think we all just have locked in our brains. So today, we're going to transform the way that we think in a couple of different ways. And the first myth that we need to transform in our mind is this. When people are more like me, it creates a better we. When people are more like me, it creates a better we. Now, that might not make sense right off the bat, but it sounds something sort of like this. You know, if my spouse was a better listener, our marriage would be better. You know, if my kids would just be more organized, our relationship would be better. You know, if my friends would just be, like, really pumped up about the things I'm pumped up about and just anticipate my needs, our friendship would be better. You know, if those liberals just realized the things that I realize about this world, you know, if those conservatives just realized the things that I realize about my way of life, then our country would be better. In other words... If you were just a little bit more like me, things would be better around here. Paul goes on to say, verse 3, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think of yourselves as better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. And just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. So Paul's bringing up two different things in this warning, right? First thing about the warning, he says, don't think of yourselves as better as you are, and have an honest evaluation of yourself. So that's saying, hey, you don't have it all together, right? Like, you are not good at everything. So it's not, hey, maybe I may not be right in this situation. If you were just more like me, well, hey, maybe there's something that I'm not really that great at. Maybe I need to evaluate myself better. And then he also says that we are all parts of one body. We all have a very specific function to perform. So we get this idea that maybe if everybody just met my standards, thing would, things would be better. Or we think we're the whole body. We're not just a part. And we say if everybody would just act like me, then things would be better. So bringing up this idea of different body parts, we're going to do this little exercise. There is a, uh, I mean, settle down here. It's going to be with paper and pen. So there's this paper, there's a paper in front of you. You probably have notes. There's going to be a pen in the seat back in front of you. Go ahead and grab that out. Pull out a piece of paper, anything, you know, offering envelope, whatever. Pull it out. We're going to write this phrase three times. I can do everything well. Write it three times. I can do everything well. Ready? I can do everything well. Number one, I can do everything well. I can do everything well. All right. Okay, so use your dominant hand to write with that. Now most of you know that your body part has a mirror image of that other body part, your other hand. Uh, so go ahead. Let's, say, let's just go ahead. Switch, switch hands and write it again. Let's try, just write it once now. I, I look, look at me. I don't even know how to hold this thing. I'm, I'm holding it like I'm holding a fork, eat, eating some meat or something. Like I just have no idea. Now our body parts serve different functions, right? But these are mirror images of each other. This one can do all the things. This one has no idea of what a pen even is. Now, if we were all supposed to be the same, then don't you think I would be able to write just as well with my dominant hand as I can with my non-dominant hand? Don't you think I'd be able to write just as well with my foot as with my hand? Technically, I should be able to write just as well with any other body part I have as I can with my hand, but no. You spend the majority of your life working on this part for this reason. So the question I want you to ask yourself is the next time you're involved in one of those times where you're either saying this out loud or you're thinking it in your head where you say, if you were just more like this, if they were just more like that, if my job was just more like this, if my boss just understood the same things I understand, 
Ask yourself, is this more about them or is this more about me? Am I expecting them to do everything that I can do? Am I expecting them to do the things that they weren't created to do? So that's the first myth. The second myth that we need to transform is when I fix the weaknesses in me, it creates a better we. When I fix the weaknesses in me, it creates a better we. So, like I said, I've worked with the Gallup organization in order to become a Gallup certified strengths coach, and Gallup is an organization that polls people. That's really what they do. So we're going to throw up a couple of Gallup polls and see what you think. First question they ask, which do you think will help you achieve your greatest success in life? Fixing your weaknesses or building on your strengths? How many of you say, A, fixing your weaknesses? Okay, I know I just said that was a myth, but come on, this is church, you can be honest. How many of you thought, okay, great. How many of you thought, B, building on your strengths? Okay, we've got a lot of abstentions, but that's all right. Let's see, according to Gallup, 60% of Americans think that fixing your weaknesses is the way to achieve your greatest success. And it should serve as no surprise to you, especially if you're in the international community, to know that Americans typically rate highest in thinking that strengths, you know, being strengths-focused. You know, we think that we're, uh, we, we've got strengths and that's the way to go. But around the world, we are all weakness-focused. We are focused on weakness. In fact, we are weakness-obsessed. Now, I'm talking weaknesses. I'm not talking sins. This is different. It's different to say, well, I need to, man you know, I need to work on sins, or I need to manage around skills, or I need other competencies. This is weaknesses. These are the things that you have been created to do. These are the things that are intrinsic within you, the naturally reoccurring patterns of thought or behavior, okay? So we end up studying all these weaknesses. We study illness to figure out, uh, to learn about health. We study divorce rates to learn about healthy marriages. We study depression to learn about joy. And in fact, I read this statistic that did you know that there are over 400,000, 400,000 clinical studies on depression and only 400 on joy? We are weakness obsessed. For those of you that answered B and thought that uh, focusing on your strengths is the greatest way to achieve success, here's another poll. Your child comes home with the following grades, English A, Science B, Social Studies C, Algebra F, this is important. Which grade gets the most attention from you? Everybody? The F. Let's see. 77% of American parents say the F. And again, read the question. Which gets the most attention from you? Now, if you were one of the people that thought focusing on your strengths is the way to achieve your greatest success, how come it wasn't the A? And again, if you're, if you're a kid in here in school and, and you're sitting next to your parents, don't be elbowing them and saying, oh, listen up here. Because like, I, I agree, you need a basic competency in everything and you shouldn't be you know, settling for Fs in school. But because we are so weakness-focused, the problem is that we focus so much on the F and the key to changing the F is figuring out why your child got the A. You spend most of your time saying, hey, let's take remedial algebra. You spend most of your time saying, have you done your algebra homework? Have you studied your algebra instead of encouraging them in their areas of strength? Or asking them, why was it so great? Why is English such a great subject for you? Why, do you, why does it come so naturally to you? And then try to apply that to the F. Do you know what age, or I'm sorry, what grade most students, most children stop focusing on the creative arts? What do you think? What grade? Sixth, I heard 13 years old. Some people say fourth grade. Now we could argue back and forth about the funding of schools and how those are set up, but it doesn't matter. Across cultures, across everything else, the age where you start to see a taper off in the creative arts is first grade. First grade. And I'll tell you why. Because I have a five and a six-year-old at home, five-year-old, six-year-old, and our kitchen, in all of our cabinets and on our fridge, are covered with these like white paper plates with different color macaronis all glued to them, with the child's name, with six letters, three of them in uppercase, three of them in lowercase, the N is backwards, right? Every time they come home from school, here's this, and oh, that's great, let's get a piece of tape, put it up on there. But once they get to first grade, the key difference will be, it'll be the same plate, same macaroni, hopefully the name will be spelled right and in all the proper cases, you know, we're hoping. But next to it will be a check, a check plus, or a check minus. Because you see, somebody starts to evaluate creative skills and talents. And I don't know where that was for you. When you had this dream or you had this pursuit, you had this thing that made you feel strong, and then maybe it was a coach that told you something. Maybe it was a parent that said you should stop focusing on that. Maybe it was a relative. Maybe it was a boss. Maybe it was a sibling. And you started to feel that dream that God had created in your heart start to diminish because we start to evaluate based on our weaknesses, based on what we don't have rather than what we have. 
So Paul addresses this directly. He says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out as much, with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage well, encur- be encouraging. If it is to give, give generously. If God has given you the leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Paul is saying, you've been given gifts to do things well. If you have that gift, do it. Use it. Right? Offer it up. But that's not what we think, even though it's on the page. Here, here's what we end up thinking. I actually took this verse, and I kind of said, okay, if we were to be honest, this is what I think we think is happening here. So this is my not real translation of Romans uh, 12, 6 through 8. Let's read it. In his grace, God has given us the different gifts for doing certain things well. But, you know, real Christians should be perfect. So if God has given you the ability to encourage others, sure. I mean, you could be encouraging some of the time. But be sure to set that gift aside and focus the majority of your time on the things you're no good at. Because God just needs you to fill a volunteer spot. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Here's a lanyard. Here's a baby. They're not going to rock themselves, right? You know? But you might be sitting here thinking, okay, great. You know, the Bible, that's all great and fine. I don't really go to church. I don't really believe in this stuff. You know, that's fine. F- fine, we'll go, back. we'll go back to Gallup. Because Gallup says that strengths are your areas where you could grow the most. Those areas of opportunity, those weaknesses, aren't your areas of greatest opportunity. And if you have ever gone through a performance evaluation, you, you know that to be true, right? At your job, you go through a performance evaluation, how do those go for you? You spend about five minutes talking about what you did well and about 45 minutes talking about your growth opportunities right? Areas of improvement. When categorically, that's not your greatest areas of improvement. You need to focus on your strengths. And here's a study that the University of Nebraska did that Gallup quotes. It's a speed reading test that they took average readers and they took above average readers. So you have people that aren't necessarily naturally gifted in reading, people that show some proficiency in reading. The average readers average 90 words per minute. The above average readers, 350 words per minute. They gave both groups the same speed reading test. The average readers increased their ability in words per minute to 150. They went from 90 to 150. I mean, that's pretty good. That's almost double, and I got the F in algebra, right? Now, what do you think with that same speed reading course, what do you think the above average readers got? If they increased from 350, what was the number you think they got? 500? 700? Oh, maybe the same, maybe 350? Okay, so naturally strong in reading. Same speed reading course. Here's the total. 2,900. 2,900. When you work in an area of strength, when you invest in your strengths, you can exponentially improve. You show exponential growth in your areas of strength. Sure, everybody can improve if you, if you work on something and focus on something. But when you work in an area of strength, you show exponential improvement. And that's why today we need to apply this to our relationships. That's why the way that we need to transform the way that we think is by understanding that God has more adventure for us when I offer up the best of me to create a better we. That's in your notes. God has more adventure for us when I offer up the best of me to create a better we. Paul goes on in verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And, this is key, take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honoring each other. It's not just about me. Just, not just about me and my strengths. And I need to offer up my strengths as often as possible to create a better we. But I need to realize that you need to do so too. And I need to honor that in you. And understand that you're going to be different. As I said before, I've got two kids. Five-year-old and six-year-old. I've got Calvin and Oliver. Calvin's on the left. Oliver's on the right. And they are ten days shy of a year apart. Ten days shy of a year apart. So biologically, they are as close as you can get from being born on the same day, from being twins. They're raised in the same family. They came from the same spot. You know, essentially the same. Now, if you have two kids, or if you have more than one kid, you know that children are different. If you had siblings growing up, you knew at some point you realized, oh, I have different wants and needs and desires than my siblings. I problem solve differently than my siblings. No matter how many times your parents said, I wish you would be more like your brother. So let me tell you about how different my kids are. Calvin is six years old. Here he is, and he craves connection with people. He is, a, he is like the epitome of a people person, right? He, um, he doesn't really know strangers. In fact, strangers to him are just friends he hasn't met yet. He will go up to anybody anytime and ask them 100,000 questions. 
and he just wants to connect with people. In fact, we were in Kroger the other night, or the other day, and it was just me and Calvin, and we were sitting there, and I'm, I'm emptying out my shopping cart, putting it up on a little thing, and he's doing the same thing, and he kind of does this little double take, looks back at, at about the 70-year-old gentleman sitting behind us with an arm full of his produce items, and Calvin looks at this guy, and he goes, you need a hug, and goes up and just hugs him. And I'm over here going, oh, bubble, bubble, like just, just oh my gosh, bubble. Just stay around. I mean, Calvin will get so upset when we're sitting in the car with the windows rolled up when he's waving at the car next to him going, hi, 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 when the person doesn't respond to him because they can't hear him. So that's Calvin. In fact, my wife and I, we have this joke. We, he will go up to anybody at any time that we've nicknamed him Amber Alert. Like we just want to keep, we want to keep a current photo of him at all times because he, he will run off and talk to anybody. Now, my younger son, Oliver, is completely different. <laughs> Oliver craves competition and structure. In fact, I think he wore this bow tie because Calvin had wore it the day before, and he wanted to take this picture because Calvin had a picture just before him. He is competitive. He wants structure. He wants his hair combed a certain way. He wants to look a certain way. He is so structure-oriented. We were playing baseball uh, the other day. Now, if you've ever played baseball with a five-year-old, you know it's not really playing baseball. He had a bat that was about as fat as it is wide. He was standing on his hat. He was like doing this, and I had to get him to swing so I knew what plane he was going to swing on so I could try to throw the ball to the bat. You know, like I'm throwing a tennis ball, and we're outside. And, and after about five minutes of this, what kind of question do you think this in, incredibly co competition focused and craving kid asks? What's the score, Daddy? What's, what's the score? Ali, you're standing on your hat. We've got, uh, we've got sidewalk chalk written out in our driveway. We're in our 12 by 12 front yard, and I'm throwing a tennis ball at a plastic bat that's bigger than your head. There is no score. I don't tell him that, by the way. That's just what I'm thinking. <laughs> I was like, uh, buddy, there's no score. We're just out here having a good time. And he kind of gives me this like stank eye a little bit. And then oh, right, right, right. goes back to swinging. Five minutes go by. What question do you think he's asking again? What's the score now, daddy? And I'm like, oh, there is no score. Like I said, we're just practicing. Again and again and again, he's asking the score. And so I said, you know what? Fine. You want to know the score? Here we go. Strike one, strike two, strike three. You're out. Go sit in the house. <laughs> you lose. So as, <laughs> as you can see, I'm not really saving up for his college education. I'm saving up for therapy he's going to need when he gets a little bit older. Paul goes on to say, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them and be happy when those are happy. Weep with those who ha weep and live in harmony with each other. Now see, here's the thing. I've got to stop. Do I want Calvin and Oliver to change those things about them? Do I hope that somehow, some way down the road... I'll, or Calvin is not going to want to talk to people. He's just going to kind of want to be in his bubble. He's going to turn into an introvert that just like stays inside and binge watches Netflix and doesn't bother anybody in it ever. No, of course not. Do I hope that he takes his craving for connection and productively applies it? Yes. Do I hope he realizes what kind of potential he has to be an excellent customer service representative, to be a salesperson, to be someone who welcomes others and make them feel warm and invited in any room that they're in? Of course. For Oliver being incredibly... Uh, competitive and craving structure, do I hope that all of a sudden he's just going to kind of put that aside and then be more team focused and like, hey, I don't care what the score is. Everybody plays. Everybody wins. Everybody gets a medal. Like, no. Do I hope that he learns how to productively apply that? and learns how to raise the bar for the people around him? Do I hope that he tries to achieve his very best and helps other people achieve their best as well? Do I hope that he creates structures and systems that help other people thrive? Yes. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think that you know it all. So even as a parent, even as a parent, I can't just take my preferences and apply them to my kids. I've got to live in harmony with them and work with them well. And like I said, one of my passions is helping people discover their purpose, discover what makes them special and productively apply that and productively apply that to overcome whatever it is that they're facing in life. And as a church, I'm so glad we get to be a part of a church that does the very same thing. And you've probably heard us, if you've been here more than one, I don't know, one week, you've heard us talk about Growth Track. It's an amazing opportunity for you to help take steps towards discovering your God-given purpose. Take steps towards discovering what was that dream that God placed in your heart in order to make a difference in the people around you. So I would say that if you haven't attended Growth Track, next week is going to be the best week to go to to get started because we're going to be talking about what your purpose is. You'll be taking a spiritual gifts test. You'll be taking a couple other assessments. If you've already gone through Growth Track, you know how amazing it is. Take the next step. 
Talk to your group about it. Talk to a ministry leader about it on how you can get plugged in. Talk to your boss. Talk to your family about the things that God has placed within you to take your next steps in discovering your purpose. And it's not just a box that we want you to check off. It steps along a journey to figure out God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. But what do we do today? We don't have time to take an assessment. I mean, if you want to go and take the Gallup Strengths Finder, you can. You can purchase a code or purchase a book. Go to cedarcreek.tv slash book for that. I'm particularly fond of that one, so I love it. But what are we going to do today? We've got four statements for you that you can take home today that will improve your relationships today if you answer them honestly. Here they are. They're in your notes. Based on your strengths, you get the best of me when... Dot, dot, dot. Fill out the blank after that. You get the best of me when... Now, again, this is specific to your strengths and the way you were created. So it's not like you get the best of me when you feed me. Right, everybody, right? You get the best of me when you let me sleep in on the weekends. No, it's not that. Specific to your strengths, you get the best of me when. For me per personally, you get the best of me when you allow me to bring creative ideas in order to help solve problems or make systems or people better. I, I will do that. I will do that all day, all night. I will just keep going and keep doing that because I love it. You'll get the best of what God has created me to do. Second question, you get the worst of me when, dot, dot, dot. You get the worst of me when. Again, it's specific to you and your strengths, not to everybody. Like, you get the worst of me when you disrespect me. You get the worst of me when you cut me off in traffic. Like, no, that's not, that's not, you may react differently when you get cut off in traffic than somebody else, but that's not what we're talking about. For me specifically, you get the worst of me when I'm stuck in small talk that doesn't go anywhere. Or when we're brainstorming an idea that we never take action on. Or when you have me doing the same thing over and over and over again. I need something new every three to six months. Otherwise, I die a hundred slow deaths. Now, I've got other colleagues, and I've worked with other people that go, no, 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 you get the best of me when you give me an expectation, when you make that expectation focused and disciplined, and I know that I'm going to walk into the same situation every single time, and that's going to be there. I'm going to push that button, and that's going to happen, and I can continue to do that knowing what's expected of me. Whew. Good luck with that. That's not going to work for me. And it's good for you to be able to know that and offer that up. The next one, you can count on me too. Here's what you can count on me to do based on my strengths. What is it that you can count on me to do? What is that best of me that I can offer up? So for me personally, and my colleagues will probably tell you this is true, you can always count on me. That if you need an idea, or if you're processing something, that you need creative problem solving, you can always count on me to be, to, to, you know, be into that. Like, they will come by my office, I'll either be on the phone or I'll be on my computer, and somebody will say, hey, uh, you know, Eric, uh, I'm working on something here. I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on it, right? And I'm like, I can't shut my computer fast enough. My tail is wagging. I'm just like, ah, oh, and I'm trying to like play it cool. So I'm like, oh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got some time. I'm finishing an email, but I think, yeah, yeah, sure, I would love to help you, right? It's just because it fires me up. The other thing is, my colleagues would tell you, too, that anytime you need energy brought to a situation, whether you need energy brought on stage or in a meeting or whatever, like somebody would call me up and say, hey, we got this meeting, this is going to be the part you're playing, but we need some energy brought in. And I'm like the Kool-Aid man in that room. I'm like, boom, oh yeah, like let's go, right? You can wake me up out of a dead sleep and be like, this meeting needs some energy. And I'm like, okay, bring me, oh, point me towards it. I'm just ready to go. I am. You can count on me to do that. Then the final question, final statement. Here's what I need from you. This one takes some emotional maturity. This is a heart check. This is where we realize, hey, there's some things that I'm not really gifted in. There are some pieces and functions that I'm not supposed to do. Some areas where I fall short that I need somebody else to help fill for me. So for me, I talked about my wife. She's uh, incredible and amazing. Her gifts and her strengths allow her to be positive, to be focused in the moment, to make fun out of any situation, and to just generally enjoy life in the moment that she's living. And I'm like completely opposite. I'm always thinking about the future. I'm always strategizing, you know, always working, those sorts of things. So I've asked her, and we've talked about this over and over and over again, and I say, I need you to remind me to enjoy what's in front of me. I need you to remind me to enjoy the season of life that we're in. I need you to remind me to stop and be happy right now. Even when things may not be going well tomorrow, I need you to remind me to do that. And honestly, I need you to remind me to take a vacation. I need you to remind me to tell me when it's time to put the phone down, when it's time to put the computer away, when it's time to put the email away and have some fun. I think you need to talk about these questions. It's not just good enough to write them down. Talk about them. 
Talk about them over lunch, over dinner. Talk about them in your life group. Talk about them at work, with your work group, with your colleagues. Share them with somebody. Let somebody else speak into those and see where they can help honor those things. Because here's the thing. This is what I realized. That if I'm not careful, I can take the best, I can take the worst of me and allow it to crush the best in someone else. I told you about my son Calvin, and um, you might not have figured this out, but we're, we're pretty opposite. I, I will walk into a situation, and I'm just thinking I'm focused on buying the thing, I'm focused on getting the stuff and getting out of there as soon as possible. And, you know, I just don't want to bother other people. I'm not the first person to go up and talk to people. And so every Friday we do donuts together, um, and it just happened to be me and Calvin wanted to go out to the donut shop to get donuts, and we're walking into the donut store, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, like I'm already welling up with anxiety. It's just me and him, and I'm going, okay, we're going to walk in there, and I'm like, Calvin, we're going to pick out one donut. You're not going to touch the glass. You're not going to say hi to anybody. We're just going to pick out one donut for everybody. We're going to pick out one for Mommy and for Ollie, and we're going to go home. Okay, great. Stay with me. Stay with me. We get in there. I start ordering the donut. I go to pay, and what would you know? There's like a 13-year-old kid behind us. Calvin turns around right away, and he starts asking him a million questions. Hey, I'm Calvin. I'm six. How old are you? What do you like? What donut do you like? Do you like the sprinkles? Do you like the strawberries? Look at that one. Why do they call it a bear claw? Like, he's just asking all of these questions, and I'm just over here dying in my soul, just going, oh, Calvin, stop. Just, I wish you would just, if we, I just wish you would just go back to the car. Can I just, can you just shut up just for a second? It was so nerve-wracking for me. I got that donut as quickly as I could, got the bag, and we went out to the car, and I, I sat down, he got his, his little seatbelt on his car seat, and I looked at him in the rearview mirror, and if you have little kids, you know what I'm talking about. I catch his eye in the rearview mirror, and I, I stopped and I paused, and I said, no, wait. I've been working on this for a while. I mean, this happened Friday. I looked at him, and I said, Calvin, why, why do you feel the need to talk to so many people and ask so many questions and introduce yourself to people? I said, Daddy, because I want people to know that they're special. Oh. Right? Because if I'm not careful, I could start to diminish the dream that God has put in his heart. I think you could do that with your spouse. I think you could do that with your family. I think you could do that at work. As an employer, you could do that with your employees. That when people bring the best of themselves, when we're not honoring them, when we're not living in harmony with them, when we're not assuming the best of them and bringing the best of ourselves back, we start to destroy the dream that God has set up for the people around us. So I got to tell you today, when you offer up the best of you, it creates a better relationship with, with the people around you and a better relationship with God. And it helps you discover God's will for your life, which is good and pleasing and perfect. In your family, in your neighborhood, in your church, in your job, we need you and your gifts in order to create a better we. Let's make that our prayer. God, first I want to thank you for the fact that you have given us good gifts. You have each, you've called us and given us gifts, and you've given us a dream in our hearts. And I even think about the people that are sitting in this room that even now are starting to think about that dream that has been distinguished or diminished somewhere along their lives, that somebody spoke something into them that ends up crushing those dreams. And God, we know that since those dreams, since that will comes from you, that nothing is truly gone and nothing is truly extinguished. And so God, give us the strength, give us the energy, give us the resources to pursue that purpose that you have for us in our lives. Whether it's attending growth track, whether it's talking to somebody in our group, or having an honest conversation with you in evaluation of ourselves. God, help us to bring the best of me so it can create a better we. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.